termómetro global por la recuperación de los mundiales de la empresa 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 de la Thank you very much. My name is Ilan Zugman. I am from Brazil. I am the regional director of 350 for Latin America. And it's a pleasure really to have you all here uh, today with us. We are obviously facing a uh, big crisis. We are facing many crises and all of those crises, they are directly related in the way that we are treating nature the deepest roots of those crises are in our relationship uh, of nature. We are in this continuing war with nature. People are disconnected with nature, are disconnected with their lands, with their territories. So this panel, we really want to, to be able to speak about that, about how we can improve our connections with nature. Here with us today, we have Adriana Calderon, she is a young climate activist from Mexico. She is from Fridays for Future Mexico and also one of the coordinators of the MAPA, which is the most affected people and areas. It is also an initiative from the, the youth. We also have here with us Tasnin Esop. She is a South African born and based. She is an expert on climate, energy, poverty and social justice issues. She is the founding director of the Energy Democracy Initiative in South Africa and the executive director of CAN, the Climate Action Network, which is the biggest network of climate organizations. Ailton Krenak, he is a Brazilian uh, indigenous writer and ecologist and human rights uh, activist. Dr. Vandana Shiva, she is an Indian physicist, writer, and social activist. At the core of her activism, there are the counter-development in favor of people-centered participatory process, support to grassroots uh, networks, women's rights, and ecology. Because of all of her amazing work, she has received a big amount of prizes. For example, the Order of the Golden Ark, the Global 500 Award of the UN, Earth Day International, and also the Right Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Nobel Prizes. Based on your contexts, in your experiences, areas of work, how can we postpone the end of the world uh, and recover our people and the planet from so many crises? When I first came with the question of how to postpone the end of the world, I I definitely initially thought like how am I connected with nature? How the people I know are connected with nature? And I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was I have a garden and that was all that occurred to me. I have a garden and it's like, is that enough for me, for my friends to be connected with nature to have a garden? And I said, no. But since we are kids here in Mexico, we are thought that that's enough. And that after, like when we are like, thought that taking out a flower from the plant it's not going to like cause any trouble like if I could a plant if I could a tree no one is going to bother no one's going to tell me anything I'm going to like get away from that and I mean the end of the world right now it's we don't have enough trees we don't have enough water we don't have enough resources so um yes I first come with that term and then I started thinking again and again, like how this fact that I just, that people and kids are not thought to care about the environment by cutting, like letting them cut flowers, letting them cut trees, letting them like grab the grass by their convenience. I started think how this critical thinking that we have when we are like children grows with us and comes with us. And we grow and we start seeing nature not only as a, not as, as how nature is supposed to be, not as appreciated as the nature of it, but we see it as a resource. And here's when we have that trouble that nature is seen as resource by young people, by not only young people, by kids, by adults that grew with this mind of 
I can cut a plant and no one is going to care. And if if, if people grew with this thought, it was easy for them to consider that as nature is a resource, I am available to take nature from those who are taking care of it, or I'm available to take nature and I'm available to dispose from it and do whatever I want with nature and, uh, you know, like just take it because I think it's mine. So <laughs> I believe that um, these adults who grew with this mindset also are the ones that have, have become government, like important people in the government and people that are they make policies and people that like take advantage of the loopholes of the law to take the indigenous, uh, the indigenous land. And when, when we are not taught as kids to keep from nature, we are, <laughs> we grow and we take nature. For example, here in Mexico, it's really prevalent. The fact that nature is taken from our indigenous people. Um, we have an example of many, many activists that have died protecting their lands because it's theirs and they have been taking care of it. And they have been like, because they know that earth, land, nature is theirs to take care and that nature is going to give them food. It's going to give them shelter. It's going to give them a home. And we, they take care of their land and defend them because it's theirs for right. And the government, as, as they think that nature is theirs and they can take it, come and just murder them and silence them because they are protecting what belongs to them. And we have many examples in here in my city, we have the case of Samir Flores, who was a protector of the place um, called Huexca, which now is becoming a thermoelectric. And yes, it's really sad because he was killed outside of his home. He was killed only for protecting their land and the health of their people because a the thermal lecture will cause so much damage to them. And yes, I think selling land and like people not appreciating the indigenous cultures and like here in Mexico, we have this thought about indigenous cultures are not like are below us, you know, like Many people think that indigenous cultures are also dispo disposable as nature. So we we think that nature and indigenous come together, but they come together as disposable. And this is a bad thing because people, governments, everyone starts seeing that nature and, and indigenous people as disposable and they start silencing, silencing them and they start selling their land, selling their nature, selling their like stuff. And for me, what I will say that it's uh, like, how can we postpone the end of the world here? I would say that acknowledging our indigenous people rights and making governments like acknowledge their rights too, that they have the right to protect our lands. They have the right to get the lands and like save them because because it's theirs and also we need to educate children on how nature is not disposable and our people are not disposable. Thank you, Adriana. And um, that's really inspiring. Um, and again, I also would like to thank uh, 350 for inviting me to this event and to be on a panel with such amazing and inspiring people. Um, it's a real privilege and an honor. Um, I, I, like you, Ilan, I've also read many of uh, Vandana's books um, as, a, as a younger person, no longer young, um, inspired me uh, very much. And of course, the whole concept of environmental democracy is something that I've drawn from um, in my life and the work that I do. So, just building off uh, what Adriana started to, to um, touch on, I think that, of course, you know, to prevent the end of the world would have to come from us, the people. And that should be the starting point. And to do so through build, you know, people's power building. Uh, that power and using that power to
to change the systems that's causing these crises that might result in the end of the world. And it is only through our power, I think, collectively and in a united way that, and imagining what a future could look like that is not like today, that I think we can change things. And I say that because th that is the experience in South Africa. It was through the power of people, mass movements, that we were able to defeat apartheid and win our freedom. Of course, there are still challenges, but we won our freedom uh, uh, and we defeated apartheid. And so with those lessons, I've always believed in people's power. And so that's the starting point, I think. Um, and how do people have power? I mean, I think that the kind of political systems we have in the world today, the kinds of leaders that we elect that have taken us even further down this path, as we've seen through last year, uh, the increasing anti-democratic tendencies and narrow nationalisms that are emerging, you know, those leaders are elected by people. And so as citizens, we have to use our power to change not only the leadership, but the kind of political systems that underpin this kind of shift uh, and um, and backwardness, not progress that we are witnessing today. I think that, the, so that is the first thing I'd like to suggest that we actually have to do the hard work of organizing people collectively um, united around a vision, but willing to collectively change these the political systems, economic systems, social systems. The second way in which um, I think that we, the people, can also exercise our power is as consumers, for example. We have power as consumers, and right now we absolutely willingly accept that dirty, polluting industries, uh, you know, have the social license to continue to do what they're doing whether that's fossil fuels or highly industrialized agriculture, um, you know, the way we use our land, et cetera. And Adriana spoke about that. And so as consumers, we also have the power to change things and to challenge the existing models of unsustainable production and consumption and just the high levels of greed associated with that, the kind of extractivism um, that comes with all of that. And then the final way I think we should look at how we the people can prevent the end of the world is through our own behaviors and through our own lifestyles. Recognizing, of course, that that is, is differentiated. You know, it's not those who are living in poverty that's the cause of these crises. Uh, we have to be clear that those who are rich, wealthy, have taken up most of the carbon as the highest carbon footprints in the world. And that kind of inequality between rich and poor is also found in the, the way we experiencing the environmental crises, the social crises, etc. So yes, I think I would like to suggest from my perspective, that the way we prevent the end of the world is through our power, through our agency, and through a commitment to change things for the better. Thank you to Ilan, and thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Destiny. First time I'm meeting you. And my loving greetings, Ayotan. We've met before. Um, both from my own life's experience, my thinking as, me, as well as the ecological perspective of the Indian civilization and really old civilization that has sustained itself. The world as Gaia, the world as Pachamama, the world as Vasundara and Bhumi is not going anywhere. She's not ending. 
You know, she's here. <laughs> she's evolved four billion years and she can tolerate a few more decades of the greed, the irresponsibility of colonization, the stupidity of industrialism, with all its myths of efficiency, productivity, I spent last three and a half decades trying to show how when they talk about more productive agriculture as industrial agriculture, every calculation is wrong. How the very idea of growth and GDP is fixed from the very beginning by hiding the true productivities and creativities of nature, of people. So the earth will carry on. She'll keep evolving. I think the issue of the end of the world is about the end of the particular world that evolved over 200,000 years and allowed our species to evolve. So it could be an end of what, when we you know there's some arrogant people who say when they talk about the Anthropocene, they assume forever after man will dominate. No, if man dominates another decade, the ecological space for man is over. Other species will continue. So the end of the world is really about will our species continue or is this an extinction moment? And that is why the issue of justice combined with the issue of a love for living and a determination to resist everything that is creating war against life on this planet. Um, I think that is what we must not just postpone, we must end it. Because, you know, when Gandhi fought, whether it was the Indian laws of, of you know, of uh, separation in South Africa with his first Satyagraha, the refusal to cooperate, and they had to give up those laws. He started the fight in 1906. By 1911, those laws were withdrawn. Then he came to India. And then he did a civil disobedience with SALT and with the Indigo and every other non-cooperation. So we didn't postpone the end of imperialism. We ended imperialism. So if your affection, uh, your, if action, the power of the people, like Nasneem talks about, if that's effective, then you don't just postpone it. You get rid of the empire, an empire that is really engaged in our times in ecocide and genocide on a planetary scale. When I started to save seeds, when I realized the corporations like Monsanto wanted to own seed and have GMOs, and they were talked about by the year 2000, it'll all be us. Well, they've destroyed a large part of Brazil and they're destroying the Amazon for GMO soya with new myths that GMO is efficient and will save the forest. Now, Amazon is disappearing, not because of the small farms and not because of indigenous people. They have sustained their farming, forestry, agroforestry, agroecology for hundreds of thousands, for thousands of years, long as the records go. But the good thing is we didn't just postpone the bioimperialism of Monsanto, we ended it. They haven't managed to spread beyond four crops, about seven or eight countries, and most of the world is GMO free and the movement for GMO free is going. And when you join the consumer movement, it's going to grow more because now they want new GMOs with gene editing, where the information technology and the uh, Microsofts and the big gates join hands with the Monsantos. Um, and the movement for no patents and seed, which is where I started, I said, you don't invent the seed. How can you take a claim to patenting it? That movement is also growing. So we are not just postponing the end of the particular world in which the human species can survive. We have to end it in the next decade because that's the window we have. All the scientific evidence is showing us that if we don't change direction, within the next decade, then extinction is a predictable outcome. And um, Adriana talked about the garden. And we have an underestimation of how everything grows beginning with the small. The seed becomes the tree, the seed becomes the plant. The anti-apartheid movement began with particular actions in particular places. And it was the spinning wheel that became instrument of freedom in everyone's hands. So gardens, I think, are a very powerful imagination for many reasons. Uh, when the Paris um, Agreement was wavering, um, I remember we planted a garden in Paris and said the governments will fail. 
but we cannot fail the earth. And we made a pact. We said we're going to grow gardens everywhere because either we'll have a poison earth, a devastated earth, a deforested earth, a desertified earth, or we'll have gardens everywhere. And that is not just the postponement, but changing the tide because the tide must change. The earth cannot bear more ecocide, more indigenous people, more farmers cannot bear more genocide. Saudar a cada um que está presente nesse encontro, é, Adriana, é, Tasnim, que, que boas lembranças sobre como já superamos alguns é, obstáculos que pareciam irremovíveis. E que bom, é, Vandana, poder é, compartilhar ainda com todas essas limitações tecnológicas, através de uma tela de computador, a nossa visita, a sua visita. Você já esteve com a gente aqui no Brasil na década de 90, depois esteve nas décadas sucessivas das convenções da biodiversidade. Esses ambientes sempre foram muito propícios para nós podermos compartilhar ideias. E eu fiquei muito feliz de ouvir a Adriana, porque é a voz de uma geração. É né? a voz de uma geração que é, está fazendo observações sobre esse mundo que a geração dela herdou. É, a geração dela ganhou esse mundo empacotado, ele veio pronto. E eu tenho observado que nós estamos é, com uma capacidade de entregas a delivery de mundos. Então, tem mundos a delivery, tem muitos mundos. Alguns dos pensadores mais recentes que debatem a questão climática, inclusive, sugerem que nós temos muitos mundos e que ah, põem em questão se ainda há mundos por vir. É, abrem para outras perspectivas, é, para além dessa que a Vandana é, muito bem nos trouxe, de que o mundo não é antropocêntrico. O mundo que nós estamos falando não é esse parque de diversões dos humanos. Nós estamos falando da biosfera do planeta Terra. A biosfera do planeta Terra ela é autorregenerativa, ela se regenera. Fique tranquila, Adriana. Aquela florzinha e esse organismo maravilhoso que é Gaia, eles se regeneram. Eles são autorregenerantes. A questão é que os humanos, essa humanidade estimada hoje em 7 bilhões, 8 bilhões de pessoas, eles estão em via de extinção. Eles vão entrar na lista de espécies em extinção por estupidez. A, a notificação é extinto por estupidez. Porque os nossos ancestrais nos deixaram muitas instruções sobre como viver no planeta. Os nossos ancestrais nos legaram um maravilhoso jardim, que é o próprio organismo vivo da Terra. Esse jardim maravilhoso. É, não tem nada sobrando nem faltando. Os humanos, com a sua fúria, é, com a sua curiosidade, estão furando a Terra, atravessando o organismo da Terra com sondas. É, nós vivemos o século XX como a civilização do petróleo, então, a civilização do petróleo, ela nos encharcou de petróleo. Eu tenho, eu tenho assim, eu não aguento mais tanto petróleo. Para todo lado que eu olho, tem petróleo. Tem petróleo no carro, tem petróleo na casa, tem petróleo no celular, tem petróleo para cima da minha cabeça, tem petróleo embaixo de mim. Eu estou inundado de petróleo. E eu queria saber se eu posso responsabilizar alguém por essa absurda e escandalosa e irresponsável derrame de petróleo. Porque esse combustível, esse material fóssil, ele deveria ter ficado lá dentro da Terra. Por milhões de anos, ele foi conservado em condições ideais, feito uma vacina da Covid. Agora, a vacina da Covid tem que ficar 70 graus Celsius para ela não estragar. O petróleo deveria ficar pelo menos um bilhão de graus Celsius lá no fundo da Terra, para ele não estragar. Esses imbecis que trouxeram ele à tona são responsáveis por genocídios, 
são responsáveis por genocídios, são genocidas. Eles matam baleias, matam elefantes, matam ursos polares, eles matam formigas e abelhas. Eles matam a vida. Então, eles são os, os, os comandantes na necropolítica, um modo de operar a governança do mundo em é, dispositivo morte. O dispositivo morte está em ação. Ele não é particular de nenhum governo. Não é o governo do México, não é o governo do Brasil, nem dos Estados Unidos ou da Rússia. Ele é um modo de operar no planeta que os humanos deram licença, concederam uma licença escandalosa para que corporações instituíssem gerentes e os gerentes fantasiados de governadores, presidentes e ministros, eles são fakes. Esses caras não são ninguém. Eles são bonecos, como naquele teatro, aquele teatro de bonecos, tem presidentes, primeiros ministros, essa, essa gente não tem nada, é fantasia. Então, se você soprar, eles todos se desmancham. Mas a nossa ancestralidade, a herança que nós podíamos ativar como um dispositivo poderoso, lembrando Mahatma Gandhi, lembrando o nosso querido Mandela, na África, lembrando outras mulheres e homens que pensaram o mundo de uma maneira inspirada, esse dispositivo ancestral ele está desativado temporariamente. Ele está desativado temporariamente porque nós estamos aceitando a transformação de cidadão em consumidor. Tasnim apontou a possibilidade de que a gente interaja nesse processo global do lugar de consumidor, né? tomando atitude com relação àquilo que o mercado nos é, joga sobre nós como desejo, a produção de desejos, de necessidades. Nós não temos essas necessidades, elas são criadas pelo mercado. Então, como nós faremos para perseverar num lugar de cidadania, e não habitar o lugar do consumidor. O consumidor é um idiota. O consumidor ele, ele é feito um, um drogado. O consumidor ele já está drogado. Então, nós precisamos ser cidadãos. Eu quero um cidadão do continente é, americano, eu quero um cidadão da Ásia, eu quero um cidadão do continente europeu para a gente dialogar. Eu não quero um consumidor. Vocês observaram que, se vocês olharem para o céu na pandemia... Vocês vão assistir é, países miseráveis lançando foguete para o espaço e botando em órbita novos satélites e construindo um, uma espécie de spa em Marte? Ora, o desejo já está aí. Tem muita gente querendo ir passar férias em Marte. Se já conseguiram despertar o desejo numa infinidade de idiotas, que vão comprar passagem para ir para Marte, é, é porque o poder do mercado e a ideia do consumidor está capturada por uma perspectiva materialista miserável. A gente tem que escapar da perspectiva materialista miserável. Nós temos que recuperar o sonho dos nossos ancestrais e nós temos que ser capazes de, de novo, cantar, dançar, suspender o céu, criar uma atmosfera planetária onde cada povo, assentado na, na herança cultural, pensando o mundo como uma herança comum, e a gente precisa botar em questão a lógica da globalização. A lógica da globalização ela fechou um circuito no final da década de 70, 80, e todo mundo, inclusive as crianças e os jovens que nasceram da década de 90 para cá, eles nem viram o mecanismo que fecha essa grande abóbada que é a globalização e nos põe todos dentro de uma espécie de circo de horrores. As corporações elas só querem acionar o circo de horror, gente. As corporações, depois que elas tiverem destruído o ecossistema terrestre, elas vão fazer piquenique em Marte. São irresponsáveis, são criminosos e a gente deveria caçar a licença social dessas corporações continuarem manipulando governos regionais. E nós deveríamos apontar quem são os, os, os bonecos manipulados pelas corporações. 
A Vandana já deu uma pista. Alguns bonecos são tão ativos que parece que são eles que controlam as corporações. Mas, na verdade, é uma ambiguidade para a gente não saber quem manda em quem. Né? Se a Microsoft se associa com, a indústria, com as corporações que controlam a semente no planeta e se ambas se associam com a indústria armamentista, tudo se funde numa espécie de Covid global. Então, a gente vai ter uma peste global que é produzida exatamente pelo egoísmo, pela ganância de alguns sujeitos que figuram na lista dos bilionários. Todo ano tem uma revista que publica a lista dos maiores bilionários. Peguem aquela lista e convide eles para conversar. Aqueles caras, pergunta a eles, aqueles bilionários, trilionários, Pode chamar o Bill Gates para convidar os colegas dele e falar o seguinte, vamos para uma ilha deserta e a gente vai conversar sobre globalização, fim de mundo, adiamento de fim de mundo, spa em Marte, férias no cosmos, discutir outras ideias com eles, porque eles estão precisando de solidariedade, de amor, eles estão precisando de um abraço. Pobrezitos! To finish uh, this, this round, uh, what commitments uh, are you making this year to yourself, to the earth and to the movement? Tenho atuado é, daqui desse lugar que eu estou sentado agora, que é a reserva indígena onde vive o povo Krenak. Então, eu estou numa casa antiga. A 500 metros daqui passa um rio, que é aquele rio que a mineração avassalou com a lama e nos próximos anos a gente vai continuar fazendo velando o corpo do rio. A minha primeira atividade agora é velar o corpo de um rio. A segunda é me relacionar com as pessoas que fazem a mesma coisa em outros lugares do mundo, inclusive com a Adriana, que vigia os jardins e as florzinhas que eles estão arrancando. E, por último, eu não estou à frente de nenhuma rede global. Eu estou cada vez mais é, sentindo que eu preciso atuar localmente. É, eu estou com essa, esse objetivo porque eu não consigo dar conta é, de interagir com o mundo inteiro. Mesmo com a ajuda da internet, eu acho que é muito exaustivo. É isso. Então, so, my commitment is both continuing my commitment of the last five decades of uh, hugging the earth. You know, my life began with the Chipko movement and the forest movement in my mountains of the Himalaya. And I think we need a Chipko. Hugging means Chipko, Ayatan. And I think we all should send a note to Bill Gates. You know, you're desperate, you're so poor, Bill Gates. You need a Chipko from the earth defenders. And uh, it's an action we could take together. Um, I definitely will continue exposing the falsehoods about GMOs as a miracle. They failed and that needs to be exposed. Continuing to work with the GMO free movement. And I want to congratulate Mexico that it has taken the courageous step to say we'll end glyphosate, we'll end GMOs. And of course the pressure is intense. And of course life is not an invention. To continue defending the integrity of life which means integrity of seeds and their freedom, but it also means resisting the new ways of patenting, which is by using digital mapping as if it's the creation of the seed. So these are new colonialism. You know, the colonizers behaved as if they had created the land which they took over. The new colonizers behave as if having a digital technology in hand means they can take over the natural world. I will continue my work through Navdania, the movement that I started in 87 to promote biodiversity conservation and agroecology as solutions to extinction, climate change, the deforestation crisis, the desertification crisis. Deforestation, because our work has shown we can on the same small piece of land by protecting biodiversity as we've done in indigenous cultures, grow enough food, for two times the human population. We don't need to invade the Amazon. Hands off the Amazon should be our united global call. And putting an end to GMO soya in the Amazon 
should be part of the GMO free campaign everywhere. Um, I definitely feel uh, not just continuing to resist fossil fuels, but the fossil fuels in hidden form, chemical agriculture, industrial agriculture, all of the chemicals are fossil fuel derived, all of them. So this, but look at the sways being blocked by a mega container ship. And while Ayatollah was talking about escaping to Mars, they want people out of the economy and everything, this, you used a lovely phrase Ayatollah, the world on a delivery service. Yeah, a world on a delivery service through a container ship that's stuck in the sways. No, we can do better by creating living economies, by creating living democracies. This is what I've called a democracy. And I think the immediate task for movements like Fridays of the Future, 4350, is I really feel addressing false and fake solutions. The fake calculus of net zero, which is I'll continue to pollute and I'll take over the Amazon and I'll take over the farms and I'll destroy the small farms. And, the, and I think we should stop the language of half for nature. Everything is because of nature. It is all because of nature. The language of half for nature must stop. And the language of rewilding should stop. It should become indigenizing because indigenous cultures knew how to live with nature. The colonial cultures created the ecological apartheid. And the other terrible, terrible fakeness that's growing so fast because it's finance so fast is fake food. We are part of the earth. Nutrition is what flows through the web of life. Real food is what we grow to take care of the earth through earth care. Real food is what we deserve to eat for our health. So the pandemic, the COVID pandemic is a symptom of food gone astray. Correcting that error means let's be truthful about growing our food and eating our food. And that's why coming back to Adriana, the garden is a very powerful place for the revolution. Thanks. So. Yeah, like Vandana, I will, my commitment to myself is to remain committed. Um, <laughs> and, you know, almost my life's work has been to fight for justice in all its forms. And, you know, the, the work that we do on climate change and to address this climate emergency is fundamentally about justice. It's justice for those who are not responsible for the crisis, absolutely not responsible, but they're bearing the worst burdens of this crisis. It's justice, of course, I mean, not that with the arrogance of, you know, um, that we bring justice to nature, but it is an approach that requires us to be just in our relationship with nature. And I just think that that kind of commitment is something that I will have to always reinvigorate. And I get so inspired by being part of this kind of discussion with such amazing, uh, committed uh, fellow panelists. The, uh, the commitment that I want to make to the movement, if I can be so, I, I, not sounding um, immodest, but because I, Elton, I, I do happen to head a global network, a very large network, and one must not squander the opportunity of that privilege to also you know, build this commitment, this desire and fight for justice to end, as Vandana had so rightly said, the very systems that has caused this huge crisis that we are in right now. That, that uh, is something that I commit to in terms of the work I do. We started doing it in this network that I'm, I now lead by moving from this, you know, we're very policy oriented, but to move from that to looking at building power and connecting with power from the bottom up. So our whole network has shifted to that focus. So looking at from local, connecting uh, peoples, doing work on the ground, 
and then looking at how that can also help build the dynamic of putting pressure in the global space. So that's my commitment, that we will fight for justice as a movement. We will continue doing that, and we will do that through continuously building off the power of people and their agency on the ground. And my commitment to the earth, as Elton and Vandana said, this earth is not going anywhere. And so it is just for, for me to be cognizant of that and to be immensely humble in the face of our earth. And so those, I think, would be the commitments that I can make. And of course, um, just recognizing the urgency of it all, as Vandana says. There's no, you know, people are talking about, oh, we'll do this by 2050. The people who are making those commitments by 2050 will not maybe be even alive to be held accountable for not fulfilling those commitments. So, and then the science is not talking about, you know, the science is telling us by the end of this decade, if we don't do certain things in radical transformational ways, including addressing our emissions, that means fossil fuels must stop. There's no place for fossil fuels in the future, not now, it has to stop. And and so that is the commitment we have to make. It's not a long-term reco recovery time or you know, ending time. We have to do it now. Uh, I hope to one day get, a, get like on the table and be as inspiring as you because I am aiming for that. And You're I inspiring. For that to happen. And <laughs> we are inspired <laughs> by you, Adriana. We are very that inspired. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to cry here, but it's a panel. So I can't. <laughs> um, so for me, my commitment will be to educate myself, to study, to like really, really go through books, do everything I have in my like disposal to just become as you and all of you three panelists and keep inspiring you then like make them like stop idolizing capitalism because it's a problem in you that we idolize so much capitalism and this is only leading us to death as we know and for me my commitment will be as bandana said <laughs> garden <laughs> i will take care of my garden much and like help others to also plant gardens and plant seeds of inspiration in the people i see about changing their perspective but first i have to like educate myself and uh yes i commit to do that and to become as all three of you as, as inspiring as that can be <laughs> thank you so much I, you. I propose that we we end this beautiful inspired panel doing what ayuton was doing hugging uh, ourselves as we were hugging our planet and our future Global Just Recovery Gathering.